Um, Bill Dunlop, so you have your people on that you need on? I was expecting one more, but uh, we can start without. Well, I'll do a, a just at like two minutes of a uh, little prayer and update, and then uh, maybe okay. they'll join us by then. Whew. All right, so I'm going to start us off in prayer, and then we've got a couple of announcements, and then a lot of information I'm sure to cover. O oh God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. It is good to see you all. So it seems like we get to see you every week, which has been really nice. And um, there's a few new faces here as well. And um, as we have said, make sure that you're checking the website under the Parish Leadership Resource page. We have all the recordings. This one will go up as well. Any of our, of our past meetings and resources or recordings, you can check there, listen with your fellow leaders at church. And um, thinking that's it on that piece of it. So just make sure you're checking that. We will have in January two meetings. On January 14th, we will have a session on budgets, how they can be made maybe not so boring so that people don't glaze over when you start talking numbers. So treasurers and wardens, you may for sure want to hear that one. Kevin Huddleston will have plenty of entertaining things for us. And then on January 21st, we will have a, a meeting to discuss the appropriate report and the changes. And there's some really good questions this year that they're asking about what we learned last, this past year and um, some things that we should be paying attention to. So join us for that too on the 21st. Anything else I'm missing, Sarah or Kevin, that we want since we have you here? I would just yeah. say to the wardens and treasurers who are here, if you, if your clergy has not received their imputed income statement from the national church, please contact me and I will, I will shoot you a copy of what I've received. All right. But they should have gotten it and forwarded it on to you already. Last thing. All right. Good. Uh, yes. All those end of the year things. Um, so I am just going to turn this right over to Bill and let Bill introduce himself and maybe the committee and take it from there. So it's all yours, Bill. Hey, I'm Deacon Bill Dunlop. I am currently signed to St. Paul's uh, Church in Watertown, and I'm also assisting at St. Mark's in Beaver Dam. Um, since both of those parishes are without a priest right now. And then also I work with the UW campus ministry uh, beside doing the task force work. Uh, we have three other members of our task force here tonight. Um, Amy Dunlop, who is, yes, she is my wife. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner with a public health background and also a medical research background uh, for a major insurance company. Uh, Jim Mahoney, who's uh, with Trinity Wauwatosa, and he also is a surgeon um, in the Milwaukee area. And uh, Miranda Hassett, who is the rector at St. Dunstan's, uh, and she's joined the committee recently. And we have Jana, uh, Troutman Miller, who's uh, the chaplain at St. John's on the Lake. And we also have Dave Mowers, who's up in Baraboo um, as the priest up there. And um, Bill Berger, who is a physician at the VA hospital, also with Trinity Wauwatosa. And so Bill, Bill Berger ha is on the participants list. I just can't see him, but okay. he's on the list. Oh, he just got added then. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we have three medical um, experts on the on the team, and then three clergy, and then primarily I do the administrative um, work for the for the task force. And what I will do now is share my screen. We have a short presentation, and then we'll take questions and uh, and have discussion following that. 
Uh, if you could put any chat, uh, questions in the chat as we go along, that would be helpful. Um, we're going to give you an update on doing what love requires, and that's what we are trying to do within the diocese with this task force and COVID-19. Uh, we will give an update of what we're doing and what the status is within the diocese, a review of kind of the guiding principles that we have used to determine what the guidelines should be and how they'll change over time. And then the guidelines themselves, any changes that have recently come about, and also um, discussion of the standard guidelines because those seem to be working pretty well right now. This is what we know. Um, this is the current status as of today. Uh, we had 3,600 plus cases today. Um, that's down from last week and it's definitely down from a month ago, um, which is a good sign. We did not see as much of a blip um, after Thanksgiving as we anticipated. There's probably a couple things that were um, a factor in that. Number one, we were so high that um, the blip probably didn't occur as, as significantly. The other thing is, is with that surge that we had kind of in October, November, uh, people's behavior probably changed. And anecdotally, talking to people from the two parishes I'm associated with, and also the students at UW, they did not travel much over Thanksgiving. And we're getting kind of the same information from you know, people around. So we are kind of bucking the trend of the nation right now. Um, as far as our numbers going down, which is a very good thing. Um, as far as deaths that are reported uh, associated with COVID-19, um, we're slightly higher than last week, um, but again, lower than a month ago. And as you can see, the, the trend tends to be going down with a, another good sign. And uh, hopefully we will make it through Christmas and the, and the uh, winter season uh, continuing that trend. This is uh, our dashboard as of today. Um, as you can see, we have 14 counties that are in the black, um, two purple and two red. Um, our current guidelines have meeting criteria allowing meetings in green and very limited meetings in yellow. Um, and that's, again, this is an improvement over the last two weeks. So uh, like I said, we're seeing improvements within the state, even though the trend is uh, nationwide tends to be going up. Some of the other things that we know, some of the guiding principles that have uh, driven what we were doing, and some of these have changed since the start of the pandemic. Right now, the guiding principle, small particles and aerosols are the big thing, the big way to spread and large respiratory droplets. Direct contact is another source of spreading the disease, but it's not as significant as those two items. Um, and what we have done is we've taken a look at what the risk of infection is, and it comes down because of the, the way the virus is spread, its exposure and the time that you're exposed. Um, the less time you spend with contagious people, the better off you are the less time you spend in air containing the virus um, is also um, a, a better thing. And our activities, our activities in worship are two of the highest risk. Number one, public speaking, and number two, singing, and, and especially when those are in enclosed spaces. Um, so that's why masks and physical distance decrease the exposure to large droplets and masks to the aerosols. And that's why it's being, we like, we stress it and everyone is stressing it around us. Hand washing and other hand to hand com, uh, contact. And so it is a way to spread the mucus if it gets on your hands, no, you know, nose or your eyes, but it's a less common way of spreading. And also some of the, the length of that, um, the life of the virus in that environment. The research is showing that it doesn't last as long as what we originally thought. Originally it was seven days. So 
it's still a risk, but it's a lower risk than the aerosol and the large respiratory droplets. The other misconception that we had to work with was that risk equals likelihood. And that means the, basically the risk of infection. Risk, the risk that we looked at was the likelihood plus the consequences. And those consequences are getting the disease itself, the long lasting effects of the disease, which are still somewhat unknown, and then also hospitalization and death, okay? So it's not only are you exposed to the disease, but what are the consequences that could occur? And the other thing is, is that the virus affects the most vulnerable among us disproportionately. So people of minority, the poor, people who don't have access to good health insurance, and the elderly are basically more vulnerable and they're also disproportionately affected by the virus. And these are things that we took into consideration in coming up with the guidelines. The most recent guidelines that we have were issued in October of this year. And the major change that came about were two standard guidelines. Standard guideline number one is for walk-in communion following an online service. And that allows uh, basically a service to be done uh, live stream or online. And then people come to the church, uh, either one family group or an individual at a time, receive communion and leave. Um, if you follow that guideline, tell us the door you're going to come in, the door you're going to come out, and who's going to be involved in the service. That's all you need to submit to get that approved. Uh, standard guideline number two is basically the same, except it's not for communion. It's for visitation, either for a funeral visitation or if you want to have people go through the church when you've decorated for Christmas or Easter or something like that. Those are the two standard guidelines. All it takes is a, a quick email to me and to the bishop saying, we're going to follow the guideline. This is a door we're going in. This is a door we're going out. And these are the people that are going to be involved. Had one today that was sent to me about nine o'clock. It was approved by 2.30. Okay. Now don't send them all in on Christmas Eve, please. <laughs> we would appreciate it. Um, there are two parts of the guidelines for those of you who aren't really familiar with them. There are requirements, which are things that are required. And that's the distancing, screening, hygiene, masks, and then also the, the temporary license for communion under special circumstances, which is the distribution of communion both in home and also um, under the standard guideline, and then other parish meetings and gatherings. And then there's also a section on recommendations. Those are our recommendations. Um, some of those recommendations have moved up into requirements over time, especially the ones involving singing because it was such a high risk um, activity. So those are the different things that are in there in the recommendations. Facility cleaning, for instance, is a recommendation is recommendations on pastoral visits. Uh, and those actually um, got loosened up a little bit as we went along and as we got confined indoors. The big thing about those guidelines were they were designed to take us through the first phase of uh, the recovery from the, the, uh, the virus or the pandemic. That first phase never came about. Uh, we started this, um, pandemic and when we had put those first guidelines in place, about half the counties were green and half were yellow. So we, that's what we were looking at. And as you can see from today's status, we're nowhere near that right now. As we also have what we call frequently asked questions. The most recent was updated in November. And those give um, some basic instructions or questions that you have submitted to us that are of interest to everyone else either an interpretation of a guideline or just a question concerning either the virus. Uh, some of those had to do with different types of filters, um, waivers for um, wearing a mask, for instance. Uh, those are all in those frequently asked questions. And it's also a means that we use to make a small rapid change to the guidelines so that we're not updating the guidelines every week and you don't know which version you have. Um, 
So sometimes we will actually issue a frequently asked question as a question and change a guideline that way until we do a, a reissuing of the guidelines. And we are on version five of the guidelines right now. Um, the resources are all on the diocese website and they include these and also links to different CDC documents and other resources. Um, and we also have an extensive um, library of uh, different, different references that we have used to develop these. And I introduced the people who are on the task force. Bishop Miller was also on the task force. He will be leaving uh, at the end of the year. And uh, Kevin Huddleston and Scott Leanna, who's the president of the standing committee are also advising us. Um, our current work, and we are working on basically planning the next phases of coming out of the virus um, pandemic. So as the vaccines start taking effect, as people's behavior changes so that the numbers go down and there's less of a strain on our medical system and everything else, we will be um, issuing re revisions to the guidelines to take us into those next phases and increasing both the size and, and ability to meet. One of the key things that we will be looking at over the next month or two is changing the, and looking at the outdoor um, numbers. Um, right now we think they might be a little bit too conservative and uh, unfortunately in wintertime in Wisconsin, you can't really meet outdoors. But once we get to that point in spring, uh, hopefully those numbers will be increased. We communicate weekly um, as a group and we meet every other week. Um, and we tend to try to post something in the diocese e-news every week, whether it's information, pertinent information, um, new guidelines or whatever. Uh, this week we'll probably post some information from the CDC website on basically preparing for the, ho the holidays, both travel and also small um, gatherings, what you should do and, and consider before, after and during a, a, a gathering. Some of the things that we are doing, again, that love requires to protect the most vulnerable among us is not to get lax. Um, we te all tend to develop a level of comfort when we get into a new mode of operation and things like masks and mass discipline are things that we need to be aware of. And the other thing we need to do as leaders in the church is to exhibit the desired behavior. Um, if you're doing an online service from the church, make sure you're masked, even though you may not need to because you've got everybody from the same family group. What that does is it sends a message to everyone doing that. Um, or if you don't want to do that, like we do our services primarily from people's homes, um, which allows Amy and I not to be masked during the service, which allows our choir to submit um, music digitally and we combine it and have a virtual choir, but do things that basically show that you're, um, you're committed to what's going on. Uh, maintain distance and especially uh, take a look at singing. It's probably one of the most dangerous things we do. It is very limited in our guidelines. If you're going to have even a single soloist, have them way far away from anybody else. But the preferred option would be to record them from home and insert it into a service. Um, we do our, like I said, we do our services completely online. Uh, play, play the video during the Zoom meeting and then have coffee hour afterwards. And it's, it seems to be working pretty well. The other thing is limit your time inside. Most of our churches are not good for airflow. Um, if you have radiant heat radiators in your um, church, that means there's no air exchanges unless you open a door or a window. A lot of us have stained glass windows and we've gone through the process of sealing them up to protect them over time for the ne next 40 or 50 years, but it also means that we cannot open a window. Um, and take, taking a look at the ventilation and limiting our time in especially unventilated spaces is very important. And then finally, um, screening. 
And some of the things from our experiences are, is it is best to, spur, to screen or ask those screening questions for COVID, uh, whether they've got any of the symptoms and make sure you have the current ones from the CDC because they do change. And the other thing is if they've been exposed to somebody with COVID. And we recommend that you ask them those questions prior to entering the building. Um, either if they're in the parking lot or you know in front of the church or as before they enter the door in the narthex. Because there's just a difference of, of feeling if you get turned away, let's say at the curb, and say, hey, you know, maybe you might not be here today because you've got it either a cold or you've been, you know, you're, somebody in your family has COVID, then to walk into church and be thrown out. Yeah. yeah. So make sure you do that uh, prior to the, prior to going into the church. Oops. Okay. Um, and ventilation is one of the key things since this is an aerosol spread, open windows and doors if you can and avoid un unventilated spaces and keep, keep air moving in and out if at all possible. The less ventilation you have, um, the harder it is or it to do, you need to limit your time in those spaces. And you know, a lot of the fixes for ventilation are very expensive. Um, to change your ventilating system. Um, and the other thing is, is we have um, a lot of things going on around us in the communities that we're in, uh, both um, guidelines that are being issued by uh, the local authorities. Just because someone says you can do something doesn't mean you should. Um, a lot of a lot of communities, even even Dane County, has issued exemptions for military uh, for uh, um, religious services. Take a look at whether you want to really exercise that exemption and evaluate the risk. Again, the likelihood and the consequences first. And remember that what we are trying to do is keep our individuals and communities well not only our church community, but the greater community around us, the best that we can. And this is taking care of, we take care of people's hearts and souls, but we also need to be aware of their bodies and their minds during this, <clears throat> during this time period. And again, protecting the most vulnerable. And then just look for opportunities that occur. Um, for different ways to do formation. We did, we've done some online um, Facebook groups and presentations through Zoom that have worked fairly well. And we've gotten basically coverage from about three states in addition to our own members. Keep your messaging up to, uh, to your communities, either through phone, email, online, or just uh, regular newsletters. And then celebrate and note successes. Um, two weeks ago, we had our, our online service had uh, people from three states and two countries um, and 25 families. Uh, for us, that was a su success. And uh, keep looking for those different successes and celebrate them. And, uh, and, and I'll open it up for questions and discussion and maybe if there's any other members of the task force who would like to add anything right now. I will unshare here. Uh, okay, Janet has also joined us. So. Oh, I see a question, maybe a question. Okay, let me see what here. Okay. Uh, um, the, the chart was for the entire state except for the snapshot of the dashboard. That went county by county. So it, know, it does cover the, the entire diocese. state. I mean, they're county by county, but there's what we're looking at is the... Is the diocese itself. The, di the counties that are, yeah, churches in the diocese. Yeah. Those counties. Around. 
I got a question. Okay. Uh, this has to do with the visitation, uh -huh. uh, 15 minute visitation that we're gonna be having. Yep. And I had a member of our parish, a single member of our parish, and she asked if she could bring a friend. Mm. Pretty much we've been talking about family or you being part of our parish. Mm -hmm. And um, she wanted to bring a friend. And, and I think one of her friends may have been another member of the parish, actually. Mm -hmm. But could they come together? I, mean, I think you're looking there at, you know, are they a household unit? Because that's really the bubble that you're trying to protect or yeah. that, that, could come, that could come together most safely. Um, I think even in the guideline that you developed for drive, um, driving through for communion, um, you had something about if the, the re, it would be the responsibility of the driver if you had people in your car that were not part of your household unit. But ideally, unless they both are quarantining and only see each other, you might almost be safer having them come separately, but I'm sure it's a driving issue. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the time in the space in the building. Um, you know, what, what, unfortunately, we, have, we don't have a lot of control over what people do before and after they come to church. Mm -hmm. But we, what we can kind of limit is that space, that their time in the space. Um, so if they come in one at a time, that probably is better than if they came in together. Okay, all right. I would say, I would just add that I, I, if, it, if somebody came to me with that question, I would say, please don't get together with somebody you're not already bubbled with or already yeah. seeing for a church event. I don't want you to take on risk, extra risk for the sake of doing something with the church. I wouldn't feel good about that. Yep. That would be my answer. That's a good so, way. But if you're already bubbled with that person, of yep. course, come together. You're functioning as a household. Uh, Amy, there was a temp uh, question on temperature screening. I think we've already addressed that. Um, yeah, temperature screening has not been proven to be useful um, because w what we are most concerned about is people who are have no symptoms but are carrying the illness. So they're not going to have a fever. Um, it may give us a false sense of security to do temperature screening. Now, there, I understand that some counties have been recommending it some county health departments um, were telling people, in fact, it was Watercam. So one of the, you know, Dodger or um, Jefferson was advised uh, the uh, Mary's room that they should take temperatures. Um, it's prob probably unnecessary. If, you're, if your health department is requiring it, then you probably should do it only because you're following a guideline that is established by the community, you know, in the community. But and most of the plans that we approve, in fact, all the plans we approved have the condition that you follow the local health department guidelines. So make sure you're aware of those as you're going along. And typically, it, whichever one is stricter is what you follow. So, Correct. Yeah. At first, it was primarily for numbers, but uh, um, I. I think we're stricter right now in many cases and numbers due to what we're seeing as far as the number of active cases in the counties. And that dashboard is the number of active cases reported on the state website. And then we take, take out of it um, the ones who are the original cases, we take out the recovery cases, and we also take out the deaths. And it's updated every day. So. There are other factors that people need to consider also, and that's what the hospitalization rates are, both in the community where they are and if they're traveling, what, where, the, where they're going. For instance, if you're going someplace that's safe, but you're going to come back to an environment where the hospitals are full or over capacity, then you may want to think twice about it, or the same, the reverse. Um, or even if you're going a longer distance, what's happening along that route. So if you travel through a state that basically has a high, um, high rate of uh, 
hospitalization and their hospitals are full and you have some sort of an accident or an issue, you probably won't get into a hospital or we'll have to be medevaced to somewhere else. So it, these, are, these are hard and difficult times, and, but it takes, takes uh, that decision-making of looking at what is the, uh, not only the, the risk of getting the disease, but the, the, uh, the consequences if, if you do in fact get it. And that's kind of what we've been using as our guidelines. So that's why we are stricter than the churches around us, um, because we're trying to protect the lives of the people who come into our buildings. Well, you mentioned um, asking the questions, the screening questions about you know illness symptoms as well as um, exposure. Uh, it was brought up recently that doing that, you know, making those phone calls perhaps the night before, or if you've got a big group and you're doing things online, um, that asking those questions sometimes has made people think about the situation, think about where they've been, where they might have been exposed, what their risk factors are, and then they self-select not to come to the event. Um, so you give them a chance before they arrive to think through that process a bit. Um, and then, yeah, the as Bill said, the idea that if you ask the questions once they're in the building, then then the sense is that you're, you're turning them out of the building rather than just away at the curb. If you do say, you know, I'm sorry, you're with your cough and everything else you need to not come in. That's difficult. And we, I don't think we've had too many issues with that. No. Well, we really haven't had too many people being able to meet inside either. Yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm Jana Troutman Miller. I'm the priest and chaplain at St. John's on the Lake and we're the re a retirement community. And we are meeting um, on Sundays with now currently 10 people in the chapel because everybody lives there and nobody is coming in from the outside. Um, and we have had to turn people away, not because of um, symptoms, but because they didn't sign up. Um, and that, that's another big issue too, is when, when we are able to start meeting again with limitations is being aware of being really um, clear with everybody about that sign up sheet. Um, one Sunday in particular. So we had started out with 10 and then it was capacity with six feet distance. And then we went back to 10. And that first week we did 10, I was turning away my um, retired church ladies um, at the door. And afterwards, somebody came up to me and, and um, brought up the psalm. Um, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than stand in the house of the wicked and he's like so which one do you think you want to be now I'm like <laughs> I don't know after today the house of the wicked is sounding pretty good so, <laughs> but that's something else to be you know aware of it's not just going to be the people with symptoms that you're going to have to turn away it's the ones that haven't signed up and so to be finding ways of making that um, really clear too so that it's not the same people signing up every week so that other people can't get in and then remember that we still want uh, guests. And so maybe we save some room for the profit as well. <laughs> hmm. Anybody else have any other questions? I haven't seen any in the chat. Anybody else on the task force who'd like to say anything? If not, I, I will say that. I was just going to say one one more thing. Things that are looking promising for the coming year, maybe January or February, um, are restrictions on singing um, in the building are are pretty standard. 
But there is a study, a performing arts study, an international, very large study um, with two universities taking part, engineering as well as performing arts people. And they're looking at um, aerosol spread of the virus um, very, very carefully. And it's a prolonged study. It's, it's uh, the third portion of it was recently released. And they're finding that if they can keep everyone masked in the orchestra on the stage and you know little slits for your wind instruments or whatever, that they can reduce aerosol spread fairly significantly. Um, so the study is not complete yet, but they're hoping to have better answers by January or February. Yeah. And if we are able to follow those kind of rules, we may be able to do more with, with music. Um, and the same thing with, with the airflow issues and HVACs, that's more difficult because there are so many different systems, but information is going to be coming out, I think, early in by the first quarter that looks more closely at how many air exchanges really do you need in order to feel like your air, the space that you're in is, um, is relatively safe? Um, so, you know, there's some hope there that we may have more information and we can make some changes when there's more concrete evidence. Miranda, you... You want to... Sure. I want to just say a word about that performing arts study. My my I've my church musician has been tracking that pretty closely. She's very um, cautious and conscientious about it, and I do think it's really I'm really grateful that they're doing that work in really detailed and thorough way. I do think it's really important whenever we're talking about it to point out that that is a, that the question that they are trying to answer is whether it is safe to do um, music in various ways in high school and college settings in educational settings. So they are focused on a demographic graphic that is likely, you know, with exceptions, of course, tragic exceptions, but that by and large has relatively light health effects from COVID. Unless your church's demographic is primarily people in their late teens and 20s, you need to be really cautious about how you translate those um, those findings and take them with several additional grains of salt. They can give us good information and maybe some optimism, but we th th that is not the equivalent to a study about churches. Good point. Okay, anything else? Let's see. Okay, thank you. All right, Peggy, I think I'll turn it back over to you. Wow, well, I actually anticipated a lot of questions. So um, this is your opportunity. If you have something you've been thinking about, or I know that oftentimes I've had people say, well, you know, we can't go back to church, we can't do anything. And I think these people are here to say that that's not true, that there are a number of things that you can do. So if you're one of those that have been wondering, is there anything we can do? I don't know, you've got an opportunity right now to ask a question. There's a raised hand. All right, Alan, are you the one that's asking? Yes, actually, uh, this is Al from St. Mark's in South Milwaukee. Uh, we've we've implemented a drive-in service mm -hmm. where we, we've got a pretty large parking lot in the back and uh, we built a small shelter for for uh, Father Steve Cool, our our uh, our priest in charge. And it's it's fully enclo it's enclosed on the top and on the sides. The front is open. And we purchased a FM transmitter that allows us to uh, uh, transmit the full parking lot and and then some. Uh, and we've we've had extremely good success with it. We've got about uh, fifteen cars, uh, ten to fifteen cars per week, and maybe. I, I would say about four cars, four of those cars are our families, are our, our people that are our husband and wife, uh, spouses. Uh, so that's been working extremely well. And while it's, while it is getting to be December and the weather is getting kind of chilly, we've, 
we've got a heater for, for Father Steve and I stand outside and I just make sure that everybody parks a certain distance away. I, I record everybody's, everybody that shows up. I make sure that they don't have any symptoms. We get reservations the night before. Once in a while, we'll get a couple of people that show up without a reservation, but still I, I record all the names. I, uh, I make sure that, that Steve gets it so that he, can, that he can record it and that we have traceability if, if there is any issues. But uh, yeah, if anybody has any, any reservations about doing something like that, it's, uh, it's worked extremely well for us. And, uh, and everybody that attends actually raves about it. They, they love the way, uh, the way we're doing it and they're very happy with it. Thanks for sharing. I know that there are a number of things in the chat as you were talking. Um, yeah, I, there was a question on how we're going to handle vaccines. Um, mm -hmm. And that is that is something that we will be reviewing in our next couple of meetings. Uh, since now we have vaccines that are fielded. Um, with the length of time it's going to take for those to get to kind of the average individual, we have some time to take a look at them and um, make sure that they are incorporated into our guidelines. And those, those actually would have fallen more into the next phases of guidelines, the phases that we never, never reached uh, because of what happened this summer. And Miranda, you put in there about the licensing issues with radio transmission. Yeah, just the FCC has regulations. It, you're pretty unlikely to get caught and, you know, find if you uh, do something that's not fully licensed, but a neighbor could complain if they get interference. We just opted, we decided we didn't want to try to figure it out. So at St. Dunstan's, we opted for a system where the maker has really figured all that out for you and is selling you a system where they've done the FCC research. And I'm happy, I don't have it at the tip of my tongue, but I'd be happy to share it if that's useful for other people. I think um, Mother Maureen Martin also has uh, done the parking lot service. They have a circular or, or uh, an island in the middle with a circular drive in, and that has been um, also been very successful. I don't know if they've continued it now, but they had people who said, even when you move back into the church building, we would like you to continue to broadcast out into the parking lot. And um, I suspect for some people it may be that they can turn up the volume and hear better in their car than perhaps they can in the church building. But for whatever reason, um, again, it's been really very successful. Um, the other thing that a lot of us are gonna have to take a look at is uh, as we return to church is being able to either a live stream or, or record our, our services and make them available online because we are get, starting to get fairly good followings of our services. And we are able to uh, serve people who are not necessarily able either because of work or other reasons to be at a 10 o'clock service uh, on Sunday morning. So if they can check in later, I know our, our we post ours to YouTube and we're getting somewhere between nine and, and 16 views of the service. Um, on YouTube in addition to what we do on Zoom. Yeah, that's a really good point, Bill. And that we did say this a few weeks back. When you go to the resource page, Don Fleischman put together a really excellent um, digital space. It, it kind of takes you through asking some questions because moving forward, we want to keep that digital space. So it really is looking at your website, these types of things, keeping them, not just saying, okay, now we can go back to the church. Let's go back to what it used to be like, but because we're not, we need to think of other ways. So yes, what are some other things that we want to keep? Kevin? Yeah, I'll just uh, throw in there that the Barna Research Corporate, uh, Company did a re has done some pretty extensive study and no surprise, uh, boomers are 70% want in-person worship, but all the rest of the younger generations are somewhere between 40 and 50% who want a digital option open to them. So it, we're going to have to be a hybrid church going forward with regard to offering both digital and in-person worship. Um, 
and, and talking also to that, um, as far as pastoral calls that I've had to make over the past month or so, the second most common uh, subject is setting someone up on Zoom and showing them how to use it. That is a pastoral call. <laughs> and there are people my age, <laughs> boomers, <laughs> so that there, there's an interest developing. They want to be on Zoom with the rest of the congregation. And they're more than willing to ask for someone that they know to come in and teach them how to do it, either their children or in some cases us. Yeah, that's been a great thing is to see different people that have wanted to, to learn how to do that and how to how to share that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other churches. I was talking to somebody yesterday from Zion and Oconomowoc, and, and it was a lay leader that was doing an Advent study, and they ended up having 30 people consistent consistently, not the same 30 people, usually the class is about 15. But that's the type of thing we're thinking about, because so often in any of our, in most of our churches, we offer something and you may get one or two people, but having this, this platform, we oftentimes can get 10 people or 15 on a consistent basis. And so it's really been a deeper sharing and a way to share in in leadership and in other people to offer things, whether it's music or uh, it's just been amazing to see the, the creativity. Another thing has been face, Facebook groups. You can, with your own Facebook site, you can set up a group, let's say for a formation program. And what that again allows people to do is to check in at any time or you to keep the discussion <laughs> that you did, let's say on a Tuesday night, going all week long until the next um, next session. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have some 70 year olds who are very active right now on Facebook sites. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we've we got them uh, now with the uh, Living Compass one. So it's really working well. Yeah, and we get to share with other churches. And so, so often a number of our places, you can join in with somebody else that isn't even your neighbor. I mean, they're just in a different part. And I think as we, move forward, uh, Sarah had sent out a survey and I don't know how many people on here took that regarding the diocesan worship and ending that at the end of the year, who uses it for a principal service? And um, if you're not, there really are just a few that are. So if you are using it as a principal service, are there other people you can connect with? And as, who was it that was saying that they had people from other countries and no. states and Still, yeah, and that's been true, that you've got a number of other people that are able to join you, and we can do that too in the diocese. So I think some things have been going on in the chat. Yeah. Questions? Now that's the, the link for the online uh, services, mm -hmm. and also the Google of Doc. Oh, that's to list your survey, your, your yep. online services on the website. And then Zion is also doing instructions on Zoom for their uh, annual meeting in January. Hmm. Yeah, and if you didn't come to the warden's meeting, I think it was last week, I did a few about how to do, please watch that webinar because Melissa did a great job of talking about how St. Andrews in Madison did theirs and how much people enjoyed it and they actually had some fun with it so mm -hmm. yeah and all that material is there that they use there are other churches too that I've talked to that they've decided to wait so they're either waiting until springtime to have an annual meeting if, if your bylaws say that so listen to that recording if you have other questions uh, Mark Ehrman our chancellor would be happy to answer them if specific about your bylaws or just let Kevin and I know and we can kind of hunt and see how we can help you. But Melissa had all kinds of great material on there. So go back and look, take a look at that. Other questions? Things you want to share with the group of what you're doing that's going so well? Well, if that's it, I agree. Somebody said this was a very informative and professional um, presentation, and it certainly was, which we expect. 
you have the group has been doing an amazing job keeping us safe and helping us stay on top of things. I know that there are people here. There are some people that didn't join that I wish had because I know that there are people that are disappointed that we're not meeting in person and this would have been a good time for them to, to hear. So if you know of people that are upset um, and just not really sure, have them listen to me. I mean, those resources are on the website for you to use and it might be helpful for them to, to do that and to take a look at the material. And the committee is, is uh, willing to, to talk with you if, if you've got some issues that you wanna talk through. All right. So if, go ahead and close with prayer. That would be lovely. Okay. Uh, let us let us pray for the sick. Heavenly Father, giver of life and health, comfort and relieve your sick servants, and give your power of healing to those who minister to their needs, that especially those with COVID-19 for whom our prayers are offered may be strengthened in their weakness and have confidence in your loving care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Bill. Well done. Thank you. As always, thank you, Bill. Yeah, <laughs> well done. Thank you. thank you. Very well done.